Well, good morning, Rock Creek. How we doing this morning? Now, wait a second. I, I told y'all I like interaction. I like a call and response kind of thing. I said, Rock Creek, how you doing this morning? There we go. Sounds like we're awake this morning. If you would, stand up with me this morning. We're going to worship. To hide this weary soul, be back alone. And I try with all my might, I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting like a vagabond. We sing this. So just when I ran out of road, I met a man. told me that I was not alone. But to believe my doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind and So long to my old friend Burning in bitterness You just keep moving Cause you ain't welcome here And from now till I walk the streets of gold I'll sing the high this wayward son has found his way back home. He picks me up, turns me around, and plays my feet on solid ground. I think the master, I think the savior, because he knew my heart. He changed my name forever free. I'm not the same. I think the master. celebration this morning if you found new life in Jesus sing this with me and I lost another one I am free who's free I am free. I am. And I lost another one I am free I am free I am free you see
Let's look at some incredible things happening at a baptistry right now. Hey, good morning, Rock Creek. This is my good friend, Noah. Noah is a sixth grader at Bethel Middle School, and I wish you could see what I see. Family and friends, just a great support system for him. We talked this past week, and I got off the phone and I said, man, it's been a long time since I talked to someone who knew their theology like Noah, and then just told mom and dad, and he's got an engineer brain, and he said, hey, I want to be an engineer. And so we're right in line with who God's called him to be. If you haven't been to church in a while, you're going, what in the world are these people doing? Well, baptism is the obedient step we take to let the world know that we're followers of Christ. It's faith in Jesus that makes us new. Baptism is the shout to the world that we've been made new in Christ. And so Noah just couldn't be prouder. And the world needs young men like you who are going to be excellent in all that they do and follow Christ with all of their heart. I want to ask you the most important question in all of the world. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Yes, sir. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Hey, welcome to Rock Creek. We really do believe that Jesus changes everything. And so say hi to someone around you. Even move out of your row a little bit. You can do it. It's going to be a great day of worship. We're glad you're here.
Jesus is mine. And no word of foretaste of glory divine. Your salvation, the purchase of sing together this is my story and this is my story this is my song I'm praising my Savior all the day long oh this is my story
You guys can be seated. It's one of my favorite hymns. I, it's probably the, the hymn that I find myself singing, just singing by myself more often than any other hymn. I, I've got a lot of favorites, but I love that. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And how important that is that you be able to sing that in the uncertain times in which we find ourselves living this morning. I know I don't need to tell most of you that the earth is sitting on a powder keg in the Middle East this morning. There is much uncertainty in the world and decisions that are made over the coming hours and days are going to be critical to our future. The psalmist said, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs, O God, to whom vengeance belongs, show yourself. Arise, O judge of the world. And what I want to ask us to do together today is ask God to be God in these next days. You see, when when we take on God's job and we try to be God, that's when the world goes sideways. When we think it's our job to be vengeful and to take vengeance in our own hands, that's when the world gets sideways. God's job is vengeance. He is righteous. He never gets it wrong. He gets it right every single time. So I want to ask you to bow your heads right now and... and And I want you to pray. I'm I'm going to pray audibly in a moment, but I want you to pray. I want you to ask God to be God, to reveal himself to the leaders who will be making decisions. I, I can't look into the book of life and tell you, but I'm pretty confident that most of the people making decisions in the coming days are not Christians. They do not have the Holy Spirit living in them. But that does not mean God cannot speak to them. He has done it throughout the centuries. So let's ask God to do that. Father, I pray that you would give wisdom to those who are in those critical positions of leadership in the Middle East and here in the West and in Europe and in China and Russia, and all over the world. Father, I pray that you would manifest your presence in in an unparalleled way, that you would intervene, that you would be God. Show yourself, O judge of the world. Thank you for For the rich promise we have, the assurance, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And for so many of us in this room, we have that assurance that, God, we pray knowing that there are many who do not. And so, God, we pray for your graciousness. We pray for your righteousness. We pray for your wisdom. And we pray in the name of the one who is the Prince of Peace, in the name of Jesus. We pray for our world that we might know and experience true peace. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God is powerful, He is just. So let's lift up some adoration to him. Stand up and join us with this last song. Let's just pour out our heart and just turn it over to God. How great he is. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart.
for one purpose and one purpose only to worship the Lord named Jesus our most high that's our design let's come back to it we sing in all the earth will shout a praise So our study of Paul's letter that he wrote to the church at Philippi while he was in jail in Rome, uh, we continue with that study this morning by turning to chapter 4. And if you brought your Bibles, and I hope you did, I encourage you to uh, open them to Philippians chapter 4. I know the passage is printed for you in today's notes, but 
You may want to jot a note or two down in your Bible that you take home with you, Philippians 4, because this has got some incredible advice that will be applicable for every one of us here today. Now, I want to alert you at the beginning that today's passage is a paragraph from Paul's letter that seems strangely out of place with a theme of joy that has basically permeated every syllable up to this point. Uh, Joy has been dominant and prominent in every verse until we come to chapter 4. So before we actually read today's focal passage, I want to set the stage by asking a very simple and straightforward question. And uh, it's a rhetorical question, so I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you for any sort of public display uh, of your response. I I just want to ask you a simple question for you to think about. And this is the question. Had you ever personally been in or around a church fight? Have you ever been in a church fight? Have you been around a church fight? Maybe you were a member of a church that was fighting. You were around it. If your answer is no, consider yourself blessed, but continue to be prepared to take notes. If your answer is yes, it's likely that my question just reopened a painful and dark chapter from your past. Church fights are unpleasant at best, but often can be incredibly destructive and take years for a church to recover if it ever does. People choose sides. Lies are told. Personal attacks are leveled. Words are used like bullets and often wound innocent people. And people find themselves defecting walking away from the church, disillusioned with their faith damaged, never to return again. Some of you know some of those persons. Wounded in a church fight, never to return to church again. Near the top of the list of reasons people give today when interviewed for why they don't attend church is because they've been hurt by the church. And, and when I say the church, you know, of course, I'm not talking about an institution. I'm not talking about walls and a building. I'm, I'm talking about people because people are the church. And people hurt people. People wound people. Even more serious than people choosing not to attend church is that sometimes when People are asked why they're not a Christian. They will say, I'm not a Christian because of Christians. I've chosen not to follow Christ because I've seen the lives of others who say they follow Christ. I'm out. Now, I know some of you are wondering, why on earth would I begin today's message with such a serious tone, talking about church fights and such, right here in the middle of a message series on joy? This is joy. Nothing joyful about a a church fight. Well, it's because that's what we find here in Philippians 4. I would have liked to change it. Back in the fall when Mark and Jason and I were working through the assignments for the church, uh, this message series, apparently I drew the short straw. I got Philippians 4. Only passage in the entire letter that's like this. I mean, for instance, back in chapter 2, Jason drew a delightful passage of Scripture about Timothy and Epaphroditus, and and Paul extolled them and lifted them up, and Jason did a great job of pointing to them and saying, this is how a church ought to work. This is the way God designed a church to function. You ought to get along. It ought to be a team. You use everyone's gifts. These two guys are good examples. Follow them. And now we come to chapter 4. And Paul's addressing a scene in the church that doesn't seem to fit with a theme at all. Yet you'll wonder almost if he's got some sort of split personality here. He he goes a completely different direction and he calls two women out by name. And if he pointed to Timothy and Epaphroditus back in chapter 2 as great examples of what it means to be Christians in a church. 
he, he was pointing these two women out as bad examples. You don't want to be like these girls. You don't want to be like them. But the question still begs to be asked, why? Not why am I preaching, I'm preaching it because that's the text. But why did Paul bring it up? Why did he bring this up in a letter that has been dominated by joy all the way through? Up until now, it's been joy, joy, joy with every syllable of Paul's letter. But now we get here to the final paragraph. I mean, he, all he had to do was hold on just a little bit longer. He said the final paragraph, the last part of the letter. And he brings this up. Why on earth did he have to bring this up? Everything was going so well. Or was it? I can't prove it, but I think this may have been the primary reason Paul wrote the letter. He, 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 sort, of, he sort of eases into it. But I'm convinced, I can't prove it, but I'm convinced it's one of the main purposes that there while a prisoner in Rome, he wrote this letter to send it back to the church. He knew what was at stake. And this conflict between these two women was creating harmony within the church and was posing an incredibly serious threat to the gospel and the evangelization of the world. Such disharmony and discord and dust-ups have have been a part of church from the very beginning. Even in Philippi. Philippi, I'm going to tell you, this church was as good as any Jesus-loving people who have ever lived. Philippi was a great church. Paul has commended them left and right about how gracious they are and how generous they are and how sensitive they are and how they loved and how they were joyful and how they helped one another. He, he, on and on. But they had their skirmishes. And unfortunately, it's a more relevant topic for us today than any one of us in this room cares to admit. So with that in mind, let's read the text. Let's read the paragraph of this letter. And then I will talk to you about what Paul is saying to us. So beginning in verse uh, 1, of chapter 4 through verse 9. So then, Paul writes, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown, in this manner stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. In what manner? In joy. Stand firm in this manner. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, if you've ever done much study and how to study scripture and how to understand what the message is and how to dig down a little bit, you know one of the things you often look for is repetition. You look for things that are repeated again and again and again because that is central, it's sort of the heart of what the, God's trying to get to in this passage. And so three times in these nine verses we have this same phrase and I'm going to ask you if you will just circle them you can circle them in your Bible you can circle them in your notes but here are, are the three phrases the first is found there in verse one stand stand firm in the Lord that in the Lord those three letters in the Lord and then you move down to verse two Paul says to agree in the Lord and then in verse 4, 
he says, rejoice in the Lord. This passage is outlined by those three in the Lord phrases. Uh, It's, in essence, a biblical template for how to resolve personal conflict. That's why I say whether you've been in a church fight or not, it's irrelevant. You've been in a fight. Some of you were in a fight on your way to church this morning. You've been in conflict. You know what it is. And this is a biblical template for how you work through conflict, how you resolve it. Obviously, here in this passage, Paul's addressing a specific conflict between two specific women in the church at Philippi, women that he knew personally. Now, let's look at the history of the church a little bit. You go back to Acts chapter 16. Acts is basically a book of history, and Luke is writing the history, and he tells us in in the 16th chapter of Acts that the apostle Paul Saw, had a vision, and the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go to Macedonia. It's just north of Greece. I want you to, to, to go up there and preach the gospel. And so he goes, and he gets to Macedonia, and he travels over to Philippi. And he's there on a Sabbath, and he decides he'll go down by the river because he expects he'll find some people praying there. Now, there's no Christians. There's no Christians in Philippi. There's no Christians in Macedonia at this point. It's, the, it's be, the, just the beginning of Christianity's explosion. But there were God believers. And so he went down on the Sabbath day, and he found a, a group of people that indeed were praying by the riverside on the Sabbath day. And he, he engaged a group of women in a conversation, and one of those women's name was Lydia. See, Lydia, we don't know a lot about her, but what we do know about her, she was a pretty uh, prominent businesswoman, and she was somewhat a, a leader of a, a group there. And uh, perhaps she was the leader of that prayer group that morning. We don't know, but He engages her in a conversation, and he introduces her to Jesus, and she believes. She accepts Christ as her Savior. She's born again. She becomes a Christian, and the church at Philippi was born. Now, we have no idea if the two women Paul's addressing now in chapter 4 of his letter to the Philippian church were there that day, but it's likely they were. And thus, perhaps, even founding members... So a disagreement between the two would have been capable of drawing others into their argument and causing serious division and disruption. They'd been there a long time. And because of that, they, they had some clout and they had some influence. And, and, and so it was when, when they started butting heads and they couldn't get along, then it was sending that kind of infection throughout the church and people were going to start choosing sides. I'll never forget in the middle of one of those church fights I found myself in, in the middle of a very contentious meeting. And this is what happens in church fights. After a while, you fight, and then you forget what you're fighting for. You're bringing this up and this up, and I don't like this, and I don't like that, and everything. It gets real muddled, and you forgot what the disagreement was to start with. That's the way it is, the nature. Sometimes it's the nature of your personal conflict, husband, wife, whatever. You start fighting over something, but then this gets drug in, and this gets drug in, and it gets real muddled. And so somebody said, in that meeting I was in, said, I don't understand. I thought the issue was this. And I had an older gentleman who, who didn't move real good, and he, he stood up from his chair, and he said, no. He raised his hand. He said, no. Guys, I will tell you what the issue is. I have been a member of this church for 40 years, and I am still a newcomer. And he sat down. And what was he saying? He was saying, I've been a member of this church for four decades, but because I wasn't born here and I wasn't raised here and I wasn't here from the beginning, my opinion is not as valuable. My contributions are not as well thought of. That's what we're fighting about. It's about control. That's what it's about. And these two women may very well have been charter members of the church, if you will. We don't know. What we do know is that they were Christians. Now, how do we know that? We know that because Paul, in this paragraph, says their, their names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. Not only were they Christians, they were committed Christians. They were engaged. They were involved. They weren't just sitting in. They weren't, weren't just showing up. 
They were involved. They had, you look at the letter, he, he commends the, the, work, the work that they had done. They had contended for the gospel. But it didn't stop them from arguing. And the disagreement was significant enough that Paul has gotten word of it in prison in Rome. And so he calls them by name. Now you got to understand, this letter's not just written, you know, sitting there, somebody's reading it. Somebody's reading it out loud. That's the way those New Testament letters were. Hey, we've got a letter from Paul. Whoever's bringing it to town comes, hey, we got a letter from Paul. Got a letter from Paul. Just came from Rome. And so everybody gathers around. So everybody is hearing this letter read. How would you like to been Yodia and Syntyche when they read the letter and he calls them by name out loud? It's the only time their names are mentioned in Scripture, by the way. What a terrible thing to be remembered for. The specifics of their dispute is not even given. We don't know if it was theological or doctrinal. We don't know if it was relational or, or personal or ethical or moral. We don't know what they were arguing about. But whatever it was, was impacting the church negatively. And here's something you need to understand. It is hard to fight without fighting becoming known. And Paul knew. And he was addressing it straight up. He wasn't going to sweep it under the rug. He wasn't going to act as though it hadn't happened. He wasn't going to hope that it went away. He addresses it straight up. Hold on to harmony. This is what he's talking about here in this final paragraph. Embrace the harmony that is characterized your church. Now perhaps I need to stop here and clarify because some of you, I see that look on your face. I need to clarify that as far as I know, we have no such quarrel going on in our church, okay? So this isn't the pastor who's going to take it out on everybody else because we got two people who can't get along, okay? That's not what this is about. I'm, I'm, I'm just preaching the text. So this is not about anything going on at Rock Creek that I know about. Um, if I knew about it, I would simply get up and call your name out loud right here. <laughs> and that way everybody else could rest, right? So it's not about anything in our church that we're dealing with now but what you need to understand and know we are not immune from such distractions and discord and division and as you've heard me say over and over again I feel as though God has called me in, in these days to prepare you for what is coming and a part of that is to cause you to be alert. Do not let a seed of discord or division spring up in your small group or in your group of volunteers or in any other segment of our church that could possibly be used as the devil, by the devil to divide us and compromise us. Paul goes beyond just admonishing these two women. He embedded in this text is an entire manual for conflict resolution. He doesn't just chide them. He doesn't just call them out. He, he tells them how to deal with it, step-by-step -step instructions. He's addressing Yodia and Syntyche, but the names could be June and Juline or Elmer and Travis or Ted and, and Catherine. It, it, it doesn't make any difference. It, it could be any names. The only hope is found in the phrase I had you circle at the very beginning, in the Lord. That's the identity we as Christians have been given. We are in the Lord. We're not in ourselves. We're not depending upon ourselves. We are in the Lord. Paul said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We have been given a new identity. We belong to him. We no longer belong to ourselves. Hold on to harmony. So there's three things to remember and do uh, in order for you to hold on to harmony. We'll go through these rather quickly. Number one, hold your turf. Hold your turf. Now, Greg, what on earth do you mean by that? Well, it's, that's, I'm taking that out of that verse one, stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm, be rooted, be grounded. Now, when I say hold your turf, I'm not talking about hold on to your opinion or hold on to your preference or hold on to your complaint or your argument. 
That's not what Paul's saying. In fact, he's saying just the opposite. Stand firm in the Lord. I'm not saying stand firm on your opinion. I'm saying stand firm in the Lord. Hold your turf. Stand your ground that you have been given in your faith in Christ. There may be those times when it's important to stand your ground and refuse to compromise when biblical principles are in question. But more often than not, my experience over more than five decades now of ministry is infighting in churches is usually over petty differences of opinion. The first step in resolving conflicts is to stand firm in the things of the Lord. You follow the teachings of Jesus. You respect the word of God. You model his priorities. You love his people. You seek to carry out his will to obey. Paul is urging them to stand firm in the faith in Jesus, not firm in their own preferences or traditions. It's not even the first time that Paul uses this this phrase to stand firm. In his letter to the Philippians, he had also already used it in chapter 1. There in your notes, Philippians 1 verse 27. He said just one thing. And by the way, Philippians 1, 27, the context is really about unity. So this is what he says. This is a key point for you. Just one thing. As citizens of heaven, you've been given a new identity. You're in the Lord. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. We're going to read that again in a moment. Then whether I come and see you or am absent, I'm going to hear about you that you are standing in one spirit. In one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. This is what it means to stand firm in the faith. It's one of Paul's favorite admonitions. He uses it again and again and again in his letters. I gave you some of the references that you can go home and look at and see how often he talks to Christians about standing firm in the Lord, in their identity. It is one of the most foundational principles of maintaining harmony. But here's a word of caution for us. When a church becomes concerned about standing firm against the enemy, sometimes we think the enemy is always out there somewhere. And sometimes, because we think the enemy is always out there and we got to stand firm in the Lord, we will be distracted of what might happen inside the church. You see, the devil doesn't just attack us from the outside. Sometimes he seeks to attack from within, inside. Petty differences of opinion. What am I talking about? Difference of opinion over the kinds of music we sing or the clothes we wear or the people who serve or the color of paint that we use or the carpet that we choose or furniture and how we place it or move it. Now, those are all about Rock Creek. I've heard them through the years. Are they worth splitting a church over? I think not. We hold on to harmony. We're together. God is doing something incredibly wonderful in this church. And the devil will do whatever he can to try to tear it up. And so you've got to hold your turf. Stand your ground. Hold the ground we've been given in Christ. Second thing, hold your tongue. Now this ought to be a no-brainer, but it's not. You know, you can think something, you don't always have to say it. That's where the problem gets. You know, you can think something, you can disagree with something, but you don't always have to be talking about it. He says, agree in the Lord. That's why I mean, hold your tongue, agree in the Lord. Wait a minute, Pastor, you're saying we always have to agree? No, I'm not saying that, but we need to always be agreeable. You see, that's what he's saying here. We don't know what these two women disagreed about, but whatever it was, Paul knew it was not worth splitting the church over. Wait a minute. You don't understand, Paul. Eunice gets to sing more than I sing. Uh, Syntyche, she she gets all the credit. I do as much work as she does, and she's getting all the credit and accolades. It's not right. I don't know what they were fighting about. It was probably something just that insignificant. It's like Mary and Martha. You remember Mary and Martha, sisters of Lazarus? Martha aggravated with her sister because her sister's not in the kitchen helping, and she wants Jesus to settle the dispute. You you know the story. It's been going on and on from the very beginning. It's been a tactic of Satan to divide us, to turn us against one another. Take responsibility for our words. 
That's what Paul is saying. Ephesians chapter 4, another church, another group of Christians, this is what he says. Therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling. I told you you are going to hear it again. Live worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Ron Davis, a couple weeks ago in one of our immersed meetings, said this statement. I wrote it down. I don't think I had to write it down because I think I will always remember it. This is it. It should never be a Christian's goal to win the argument. That should never be our goal. Does it mean that you give in and, and, and say that they're right and you're wrong. That's not what I said. It should not be the goal. It should not be your objective to win the argument. It's not about you. And it's not about me. It is about him. Agree in the Lord. Paul calls the church here to help settle this dispute. How do you like that? Not only does he call Eunice and Syntyche out, he, 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 uh, he, he asks somebody to get involved to engage, to help settle the matter. It hurts everyone. It hurts the church. You have to address it. One Christian's animosity against another is never a private matter. It's not just between two people. Everyone's impacted. Everyone's affected. So he's asking you to intervene here in verse 3. I'll also ask you, true partner, we don't know if he's talking about the church family or if there was a specific individual, but he said, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. It's not just the job of a pastor to broker peace. He says, you get involved. You help these two ladies work through their differences. You agree in the Lord. You know, the problem with helping is sometimes we give bad advice. I was talking to a pastor the other day, not, uh, not, not long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, actually. And, and he was talking about he had had three different conversations that very week. That, that very week, he had had three different conversations with three different sets of people. And all three of them were messed up because of advice, and I might say unbiblical advice, they had been given by Christians. You need to be very careful about the advice you give and make sure that you are giving advice that God would give. It needs to be biblical advice. This book is filled with great advice. There's a whole section of it that's called wisdom literature. But so often we don't give that wisdom literature as advice, we give our opinion as advice. And on two of these occasions, I'm just going to say, on two of these groups he's saying, that there was a marital problem and there were a group of people from the church that said, you just need to leave your husband. You just need to leave him. A message for another day. Agree in the Lord. It's not about you getting your way. Christ never insisted on his way. Don't make the conflict about you. Hold your turf, hold your tongue, and finally hold your temper. He said, rejoice in the Lord. Many of the, much of the time, the conflicts that we experience, both personally or corporately in a church, are initiated by, by our emotions. Emotions often lead us away from God, not direct us to God. Whenever I'm called and ask, somebody's got a problem and, and they're, they're struggling with it and, and I agree to meet with them and I find out that it's all rooted in emotions, I immediately know what to do. I start pointing them toward Jesus. Because you will never make a good decision if you're making decisions based upon your circumstances and the emotional upheaval that those circumstances have created in your life. you got to focus. you got to change. And, and Paul's going to get to that in a moment. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16, he said, Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, 
rejoice always. How in the world can we do that? Well, the problem is that we think of joy as an emotion in response to our circumstances, but it's not. It's not about a feeling. It's about a choice. We choose. It's volitional, not emotional. We make the choice to rejoice in the Lord. Re- refuse to allow conflict to blind you. Paul is asking us to hold on to harmony. But you know what we tend to want to hold on to? Our hurt. We want to hold on to our hate. We want to hold on to the disagreement. We do not prioritize harmony in the church. Hold on to harmony. That's what Paul is saying here. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near I have to tell you, in most of the church fights and personal fights I've, been, I've witnessed, the Lord has been nowhere in sight. Seek his presence when folks get angry and turn on one another. When he says, let your graciousness be known to everyone, that word graciousness literally translated for us today would be clemency. It's, it's, talking, about, uh, not, it's talking about refusing to retaliate. Now, these next four verses, and I don't have time to really unpack these. These next four verses are the template for helping ourselves. But I, I, let me just, let me just uh, tell you, they're not sentimental statements that are just supposed to be cut and pasted and put on the wall as some, something on the wall. That, that, that takes them out of their context. Now, this is talking about these things are talking about resolving conflict. And there are like bullet points for that. And I'll just give you the three. Uh, we won't unpack them. But number one, pray. Pray. That's what, that's what he says in the, in the text. Don't worry about anything but in everything through prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request. What he's saying is vent toward God. you got a problem, vent to God. Talk to him about it. And when you vent to God, guess what? It's going gonna, it's gonna to cause a, a, a peace with that other person. You vent to God. It allows us to be at peace with others. And then... He tells us uh, to change our focus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, lovely, commendable. You ought to circle every one of those words. Pure, honorable, lovely, pure, just, commendable. He says, change your focus. Look for the good, not the bad. That's what he's saying. Don't focus on what you disagree with. Focus on what you agree. Agree in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. There was a day when these two women at Philippi had no problem seeing the good in one another. But that was in the rearview mirror. Now they had a hard time seeing anything but the bad. Because that's what they look for. And then the final thing would be in verse 9. Obey. Do what you have learned and received and heard of me and seen in me. You see, our faith is walked out, not just thought out. It's walked out. I want want to conclude with some excellent advice from one of the great Old Testament stories in the Old Testament. Joseph had 11 brothers. You know the story from Genesis. Joseph had 11 brothers. They hated him. They resented him. It was obvious he was favored by God. He was favored in so many ways. They thought he was their dad's pet. Maybe he was. I'm not sure. But they they resented their brother. And that resentment turned into hostility and hatred. And that uh, bled into... uh, betrayal and they sold their brother into slavery and it pushed Joseph into a a a complete uh, chapter of uh, uh, several chapters of life of misery and hardships but God intervenes and he pulls him out of that hardship and this is what Joseph said about that whole thing. His brother's selling him, uh, selling him as a slave, and he goes over here, and he, just life is horrible. And Joseph said, what others intended for evil, God intended for good. And late in the story, Joseph has, has gained great prominence and power. And basically, he, he has his brother's future in his hand. They come begging. Perfect time for retaliation. Perfect time for vengeance. Joseph forgives them, embraces them, loves them, and sends them back to Canaan to retrieve Jacob, their dad, so that they could be reunited with him as well. And then he had one final request of these brothers who had treated him so despicably, but whom he had forgiven 
He had one request, and it's the final request. So Joseph sent his brothers on their way, and as they were leaving, he said to them, Don't argue on the way. And as you leave today, that is my advice. Don't argue on the way. This is a spiritual issue. It will not stop by itself. It will not go away automatically. You have to take a step. Hold your turf. Hold your tongue. And hold your temper. Father, I thank you so much for um, restoring us as Joseph restored his brothers. Reconciled forgiven and yet Joseph still knew the tendency was them for them to argue and quarrel on their way home to disagree with one another but Joseph begged them don't argue God I pray for Rock Creek I thank you for the harmony of our church I thank you for the well-being for your favor and it is my prayer for all of us as your church family called Rock Creek that we would love as you love that we would forgive as you forgive that we would be gracious as you are gracious and that we would stand firm in the Lord that we would agree in the Lord and that we would rejoice in the Lord and I ask this in the name who of the one who can make it happen Jesus Amen. All right. Get your blue envelope out. I know. Glad that's over, right? Blue envelope. Uh, if you are a uh, member, you know uh, this is the, one of the ways that you can uh, give your offering. There are other ways that you can give it online or with our app. You can do that. But uh, some of you continue to do this uh, method, and that's great. And uh, if you are a visitor you can please fill this out as a welcome envelope and if you have a prayer request anybody you put that on the back if you made a decision today if you'll indicate that by checking one of those boxes on the back one of our pastors will uh, be uh, calling you this week and helping you with whatever decision that you felt the Lord uh, was asking you to make today all right so ushers if you would get in your place ready to receive the offering Uh, And uh, while they're receiving the offering, you guys can go ahead, uh, take a look at the the screen. Mark's got an important uh, message. Thanks, Greg. Hey, what a great Sunday at Rock Creek. I'm so glad that you're a part of it, and, uh, and I hope that uh, you have a fantastic week coming up. But right now, I want to tell you about a couple of things. One, next Sunday is fill the truck for our food bank ministry. You know, the food you bring, the food bank here at Rock Creek really depends on that. So the list there is in your worship guide. And just be sure, bring that next week. Help us out at stocking our food bank shelves. Also, men, Man Church is coming up Thursday, April 25th. Justin Martin with Duck Commander is going to be here. Uh, Food is a taco bar. It's going to be a great night, men. Be sure and get a ticket to be a part of that, okay? And you see behind me, this is our new food bank center. I'm excited. Coming up on April 28th. I'm going to be talking about in my sermon some interesting ways that you and I can be a part of this ministry starting right now and when we're going to open the doors. I hope you'll be here for that. Have a great week, okay? And Greg, it's coming back to you right now. And I'm going to tell you, don't argue on your way out of here. Y'all have a great week, okay? It's my problem. I forgot to say that. If they-